This is the first episode in a multi-part series based on the nHibernate Object Relational Mapper. In this episode, Chad will be reviewing what nHibernate is and what it can do for you. nHibernate. nHibernate is an object relational mapper. So you have, uh, let's say, uh, you have a database already established, um, but you need to get that into objects into your .NET realm. Um, and you might already have some objects set up or you have the way that you want to model it uh, the, your business problems in memory, they're basically you're in, in your .NET code, and that might not necessarily map one to one uh, with what's in your database. So, uh, you know, object-oriented design is a fundamentally different problem and solution uh, than is relational database design. They they solve different problems. Uh, they're trying to solve two different problems, right? So they're each good in their own right. <clears throat> But if you try to apply object-oriented design to your database and try to apply a relational data schema modeling to your objects, uh, you know, bad things start to happen. So the idea is, well, what, what if we could have the best of both worlds and then have some sort of glue in the middle that would um, you know, be able to translate between the two? So here's my objects, and here's how I want them persisted. You figure out all the details. So that's kind of what nHibernate does. That's what an ORM does. Um, why would I use it? I, I kind of went through that already. Um, <clears throat> when would I use it and when wouldn't I? So when you would use it is, is if you're building a system of any sort of complex size that does involve more than, you know, just a few tables in your database. Um, so, you know, if you, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's rules of thumb or something perhaps, uh, you know, more than like five tables. Um, and then the other side of that is if, if you get you know really really big complex projects you might need to use different strategies or use and hibernate for some of it but not for all of it um, and hibernate because it does a lot of the SQL generation for you it actually generates SQL at runtime um, there are certain high performance type scenarios like if you do need to do a lot of reporting or you need to do a lot of uh, you know heavy analysis which is running which are running really nasty queries against the database that's not what Hibernate is about and Hibernate is, is it's not just about crud because um, you can do some complicated queries and there is you, you do have quite a bit of control over the SQL that gets generated but if, if you're if you're pushing around you know um, several million records and you need to do a count or averaging or something on those uh, and Hibernate is not something you'd want to use for that. You'd actually want to write SQL queries. Maybe you have them in store procedures or, or kept somewhere else. <clears throat> so this is basically, you know, a, a good use case of Hibernate is a line of business application. Maybe you're writing an e-commerce application, shopping cart sort of thing, you know. Um, uh, I can go in. Uh, actually, this, this probably isn't a good place to put this one instead. That should probably be like at the end. But there are a few other frameworks out there that do things that are similar to what in hibernate does um, uh, if if you need an ORM but you your database is such that it's so convoluted or, or so hokey and has all these weird trips and traps and tricks that it, it, it would confound an ORM you can use ibatis um, which allows you it Basically, you say, here's my objects, and here's the SQL I want to map these objects, and it takes care of all the pushing the properties around for you. Um, Link to SQL is a very lightweight. Um, it does have ORM features. I wouldn't call it an ORM necessarily, but you can, you can kind of trick it into becoming an ORM, but it's bound directly to SQL Server, whereas in Hibernate supports uh, Oracle SQL, pretty much SQL Server 2000 and later Oracle eight, nine, and later, <clears throat> um, you know, SQLite, MySQL, Post, Postgres, uh, you know, supports pretty much all the major ones, DB2. At this point in the recording, Zach Young, with whom I was Skyping, uh, made a point that N Hibernate is actually based originally upon the Java Hibernate framework, which was, I think it went 1.0 in 2002. Uh, so it's actually been around for quite a while. It's very battle-tested. Um, it supports many different databases. Uh, and Hibernate is not just, uh, it's not a spring chick. It's not something that just came out of nowhere. It's, it's based on uh, the code and the engineering and the design of the original Hibernate framework. It has uh, lots of database support. 
So Link to SQL is very limited in that respect. Um, Link to SQL is also missing, missing a few what I would call critical features that any ORM should have, such as um, what I call transparent, well, it's not just me. I mean, other people call it that. Sorry, I didn't come up with this term myself. But uh, transparent lazy loading. So Link to SQL does support lazy loading, but it's not transparent. You actually, like if you have a customer and it has an order, a list of orders on it, you can designate orders to be a lazy loaded collection. And then in your code, when you actually, when it's time where you actually want it to load up the, <clears throat> that collection from the database, you actually have to tell it, you have to say, you know, orders dot load, and then it goes and grabs it. Whereas transparent lazy loading is you can just start for, you know, you just say for each order in customer dot orders, and, and Hibernate will know at that point, transparently it will actually go and say, oh, okay, hang on just a second, I need to go to the database and get this. So it, your code doesn't change. Um, in fact, uh, this leads me to one <clears throat> quick point about one of the kind of overriding features that and Hibernate offers that a lot of the other ORMs are kind of, uh, I don't want to say wannabe ORMs because a lot of them don't want to be ORMs, they, they end up just having some ORM features, <clears throat> is a concept called persistence ignorance. So um, and Hibernate can be totally uh, off, off uh, what was I saying? It, it can keep its hands totally off your objects. You don't have to have any attributes on your objects. You don't have to have derive from a base class. You don't have to implement any special interfaces. You can just have straight what they call POCO objects. You know, just straight object with properties um, and methods, and no fancy. Uh, you know, you don't have to decorate your classes, right? You don't. You don't have to tie your classes directly to the uh, to the framework. You know, I, I can rip out and hibernate and put in a, a different ORM that also supports persistence ignorance and you would never know it. And I can use my domain model objects for totally different purposes. Uh, maybe I'm not connected to a database. Maybe maybe it's an in-memory thing. Maybe I'm, I'm hosting a simulated environment or, you know, it gives me a lot of flexibility about how I want to do it. It also allows me to use my domain entities, my domain objects, um, I can run it against different models of the database. So uh, one example I used um, is I have an online transaction model, you know, which is what most of us usually think of when we're talking about a database model. It's highly normalized, lots of foreign key constraints, and you, you know, lots of constraints, and uh, you know, it's the one that you're constantly selecting and inserting and updating from. Uh, but you might have another model, which is your reporting model, which is um, totally denormalized, optimized for query only. And it's basically just a bucket and you just pour stuff into it occasionally and then you, you uh, point your, you know, your business users or your analysts at that and let them run their real nasty queries on that sucker because it's totally optimized for query. Um, so my application changes very little. I still have my domain entities, and I have I may have an n hibernate mapping to my denormalized model, and I have an n hibernate mapping to my highly normalized model. And so depending on what database I'm connected to, I can have different mappings that know how to translate it to that model, and I don't have to change my my primary code at all. <clears throat> so uh, entity framework is another one that's been getting some some uh, focus lately from Microsoft. So it, it is much more than just an ORM. It does have some ORM features, but it, as of this time, uh, as of the V1 version, uh, the, the current shipping version, V1, it does not support persistence ignorance. You actually have to implement an interface and derive from a base class. There's also a bunch of attributes you have to put on your properties and methods and things like that. Um, very intrusive into your domain model. Um, and, you know, it's, it's mostly designed for dragging your database schema it, onto a design surface and it, turn, it generates, code generates objects for you. If you already have a domain model, Entity Framework is very difficult to work with. V2, they're planning on adding uh, persistence ignorance features. So uh, keep an eye on that. Um, I still, it's still missing a bunch of other things that N-Hibernate currently has. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it an N-Hibernate killer, but it will soon become... Uh, a decent alternative to and hibernate if you're in a you know Microsoft only sort of shop or you have any problems and hibernate is open source and so some organizations are dogmatic no open source so yeah. um, so to get started uh, with and hibernate um, we're going to be using the 2.0 version which was just recently